and busts and statues that we will be doing for the most part. I'm reminded of this uh, work by uh, seminal research by Richard Davis where he talks about um, sculptures and busts and images in general having a rather intrusive nature is that they tend to crop up in places that are sometimes incongruent and sometimes unexpected. Um, and that is perhaps the enigma of the images. Uh, they can be Indian images at the British Museum, for example, images that do not belong there in air quotes, or they can be the other way around, taken to the very extreme. Roman emperors, probably of French provenance, in a British-made museum in the city of Kolkata in India. So that is, in a sense, the enigma that we shall be discussing today in brief. Uh, to introduce today's uh, August panel is my distinct privilege at the Victoria Memorial. We have with us uh, Dr. Gianluca Rubagotti, of course, the Consul General. Uh, he holds a degree in international law, cum laude, from the University of Brescia in environmental law and from the University of Milan in environmental law. He holds a PhD in international economic law from the Bocconi University of Milan. Please pardon my uh, pronunciation if I'm doing them wrong. Uh, and since 2007, Dr. Rubagotti has been serving as a diplomat with the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Rome. And after serving in several consular missions across the world, we have had the pleasure of his company here in our city, where he has been serving as the Consul General of Italy in Kolkata since 2020. Of course, the star of the show, who is in the city for about a week, is uh, Professor Chiara Rostagno. Am I pronouncing it right? Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, she's an architect at the Italian Ministry of Culture and an expert in conservation and museums. She was the, the TV director of Leonardo's Last Supper Museum. And Dr. Rostagno is a university professor since 1999 and is the author of more than 50 publications on the topics of cultural heritage, history, and restoration. He is currently, she is currently responsible for guiding the Palazzo Aches Litas uh, Milan Artistic Vision and all of its programming, research and collection initiatives. She is currently teaching conservation and restoration project at the Botticono School of Restoration, Valor Italia, Milan, and Enhancement of Fragile Cultural Heritage at the University of Menal, uh, Milan Bicocca Doctoral School. I would uh, now take a break and invite uh, Mr. Samarendra Kumar, the Secretary Curator, to uh, welcome the audience before moving on with the other panelists and moderators. Uh, among the others, of course, we have our own Professor Shuganta Choudhury, who barely needs any introduction. Uh, Professor Choudhury is Professor Emeritus at Jadavpur University. He is a corresponding fellow of the British Academy and an honorary fellow of the Asiatic Society of Bengal. He has held visiting uh, and prominent appointments at numerous institutions in India and abroad, including the All Souls College, Oxford, St. John's College, Cambridge, School of Advanced Study, London, and the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Choudhury's principal field of research is the European and English Renaissance, and he has authored and edited several books on the subject. Of particular note, of course, are the third Arden edition of A Midsummer Night's Dream, Infirm Glory, Things Reborn, Essays on the Renaissance, he has constructed, conducted several prestigious projects in the digital humanities, most notably Bichitra, the online valorium of Rabindranath Tagore's work, and he has translated extensively, chiefly from Bangla to English, including a selection of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks from Italian to Bangla, and has written a detailed commentary on in Bangla on Dante's Inferno and Purgatorio. And to cap it all, we have uh, Dr. Shujan Mukherjee, Dr. Shujan Mukherjee is a researcher, writer, and translator based in Kolkata. He is currently a Mellon Fellow post, uh, of, for postdoctoral studies at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta, having completed his PhD on colonial memory and urban spaces from Jadavpur University as a SILF Fellow. Shujan is interested in public humanities in India, having worked with a number of museums and archives, including the DAG's Museum Initiative, our own Victoria Memorial Hall, the Guru Shodaya Museum, and the School of Cultural Texts and Records at Jadavpur University. He was awarded an archival fellowship by the India Foundation for the Arts in 2014 for a project based in the CSSC's archives. And of course, uh, to formally start the program, I would now invite Mr. Samarendra Kumar, the Secretary and Curator of Victoria Memorial Hall, for a note of welcome and to felicitate our speakers today. Thank you. Yeah. 
Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Victoria Memorial Hall, southern lawn of this uh, beautiful monument in the city of Calcutta. It's uh, known uh, one of the, uh, I think, a very eminent monument which is seen everywhere if you, if you talk about Calcutta or West Bengal. Uh, we have with a very distinguished panelist here. So we welcome uh, Dr. Gianco, Gianluca, the Italian Consul General, uh, Professor Piera, uh, Professor uh, 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 Sukanta Chaudhary and uh, uh, Dr. Sujan Mukherjee here, uh, who will be just uh, doing this uh, very interesting session on Italo Kolkatan Heritage Conver uh, Conservation Series, The Enigma of Emperors. I think it's a very interesting topic for all of us because we have some uh, uh, beautiful uh, one of the sculptures here, uh, which uh, she will be explaining and uh, she will be discussing more about that. I hope your visit to Calcutta was uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, quite uh, interesting and uh, fruitful here. And with this, in the southern lawn, when we talk to about this uh, particular topic, I think we'll be benefited by your talk with that. Uh, we welcome all the guests who are present here, despite their position, they are here. And I, I hope this uh, interesting session will be beneficial for all of us. I thank all the press and media also who are present here. And uh, I hope this deliberation will be quite uh, successful and very you know, informative for all of us. Thank you once again for coming to this future monument and I hope uh, this association with Italian Council continues in the future also. Thank you very much. And uh, I have uh, just a small, uh, on behalf of this Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Uh, before formally handing over the proceedings to the moderator of this evening, Dr. Mukherjee, I would invite uh, the Consul General himself, uh, Dr. Gianluca Rupagotti, to introduce and talk about the series that we have been having, of which this is the third occasion, the italo Kolkatan Heritage Conversations. Yes, I wanted to stand here because I wanted to make a small introduction to uh, the reason why we are here this evening. As it was said by our uh, hosts here, whom I thank very much because we are in a beautiful setting, maybe the most iconic place of the city of Kolkata. We are here for another edition of these uh, events that we have designed uh, from the Consulate General of Italy in Kolkata. The Italo Kolkatan Heritage Conversation Series, as you can guess from the name, have a clear objective of creating a discussion about heritage and from Rome to the UK. So, Jure Sanguinis, as uh, this is one of the main criterion to, to establish citizenship, they are the artists from the Roman time on. So this is the first connection and the second connection is these 12 busts here. We ask Victoria Memorial to arrange for a stage here so that you can have at least a little perspective on some of them and I would invite you uh, after this talk to go and have a look. And uh, uh, we have a few things that we would like to discuss about. Who made these statues? Why are they here? Through which route? These are just some of the aspects of the enigma that uh, we think, uh, I don't think it's possible to solve completely, but we will try. And we will try guided by Sujan with the help of these uh, other eminent scholars that we have here. So I would ask Sujan to start uh, this conversation as he has been always. When I was visiting the Victoria Memorial and um, I saw these 12 marble statues over here and um, you know there's this um, very sort of provocative saying by the philosopher uh, Henry F uh, Musil who said that there's nothing as invisible as a monument because I mean it's there but you don't really see it quite often. So um, it, it felt to me like these were also somewhat invisibilized in the sense that they blended in so well with everything that you would barely notice them. And um, I, I 
you know, it, it reminded me of the 12 Caesars that I had read about. Of course, later uh, we were able to confirm with the Victoria Memorial that these indeed were the 12 Caesars that were originally, um, not originally, but the first recorded sort of uh, mention of them was in the governor's house uh, or the Raj Bhavan as it is today. And um, I, I, what what intrigued me was that for the first time in my knowledge, these were out quite outlandish. So one of them is that Napoleon apparently was sending them to either the Nizam of Hyderabad or to Tipu Sultan and, and from that uh, it came to the French and from the French the British uh, got hold of this. There's another theory that these were there in the Chandunagar which was earlier a French colony in the court at Chandunagar and in 1756 when Clive and Watson laid siege they uh, captured these which were later added to this. Then comes along uh, Lord Curzon standing over there um, who came and said that you know all of this is quite um, dubious. I think that these were ordered by Wellesley and Wellesley had them made for the Raj uh, for the governor's house. Um, this There is a problem with this idea so we will try to go over that as well. But to start this conversation off I think um, I'll, I'll pose the first question to Professor Shukanto Choudhury um, because you know this is probably the first time that these are out in public view. I mean uh, it was quite restricted in the governor's house. So um, do you think that this kind of uh, more public exhibition um, adds anything or opens up possibilities of how we understand uh, the status of these statues. So if you would just like to reflect on that. Um, in fact, rather minor instance, almost an anecdotal instance, of a process that is necessarily, desirably, uh, taking place, uh, you know, through these 75 years since India's independence. How the, the entire sort of material heritage of the Raj is gradually acquiring, uh, it is becoming of uh, more Indianized and popularized. I mean, the space, what was originally the space, the intellectual and artistic space of the Raj, and above all, the cultural and political space of the Raj, is taken over by uh, you know, Indian uh, uh, factors and Indian forces. Uh, I mean, the King's Way and Queen's Way in the heart of the what was previously and still is the capital in British time, an integrated article, architectural piece that one should not mess about with, as unfortunately the Belvedere uh, Palace that used to house the National Library has been asked about it. But the collections of the Victoria Memorial are, of course, they have been uh, over the last few decades considerably um, sort of rethought and reorganized. New galleries have been introduced so that in this uh, sort of architectural seat of the Raj, you now have a much a museum, a much broader scope of uh, is the, the full history of Indian life and Indian uh, history uh, during that time and even later. And I think this is, you know, one of the innumerable uh, sort of uh, minor outcomes of this great process at work throughout India that we see here, that these statues uh, whose subject matter isn't even British, it's, uh, it's of course Italian, Roman, ever, uh, going back uh, some 2000 years before the British Raj. Uh, but, and these were long after the end of the Raj, still in a somewhat confined space within the very privileged confines of the government, the government house, the Raj Bhavan, oh, in whose ambience maybe something of the Raj still lingers. Uh, and now they're out here for you know, the entire public which uh, visits the Victoria Memorial, not just the memorial itself, but the grounds around them. I don't know, I mean, in British times, did so many people, it was always a public monument, of course, but did so many people come to the Victoria Memorial? Did so many children play around here? And I think this is, you know, one of the innumerable uh, sort of uh, minor outcomes of this great process at work throughout India that we see here, that these statues uh, whose subject matter is even British. It's, uh, uh, it's of course, Italian, Roman, uh, going back uh, some 2,000 years before the British Raj. 
Uh, but and these were long after the end of the Raj, still in a somewhat confined space within the very privileged confines of the government, the government house, the Raj Bhavan, uh, in whose ambience maybe something of the Raj still lingers. Uh, and now they're out here for you know, the entire public which uh, visits the Victoria Memorial, not just the memorial itself, but the grounds around them. I don't know, I mean, in British times, it's so many people, it was always a public monument, of course, but it's so many people come to the Victoria Memorial, there's so many children play around here. Uh, so, uh, you see, there is uh, this great process at work, process which I think is you know, chiefly very much uh, for the good, essential, something inevitable, although it occasionally produce some results which uh, seem a little odd. Uh, and this is just part of that. And our discussion today is part of that. And it's also interesting in a different way that we are looking beyond uh, the confines of our, our British um, inheritance, or whatever you want to call it, to look at the wider European perspective that has increasingly from the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century and beyond been ignored in, uh, you know, Indian, in India's um, political and intellectual relations with the West. See, we have focused too much on in Britain and on the Anglophone world and that you know we are opening out more and more beyond that and Today we have this chance of a conversation with the actual country whose history accounted for the subject matter of these busts. So I think that's something heartwarming. And uh, so now maybe we should proceed to the discussion itself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shukantuda, for... Uh, I, I, I think we will come back to these ideas uh, throughout the conversation because a lot of it is about I mean, one part is, of course, making, um, you know, tracing the origins, but it's also about how we receive them, what they mean, uh, how their status changes over time and so on. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about these sculptures is that um, it, when, when, when the first sort of uh, recordings happened, there was no name attributed to them in the initial stages. Then later on, I'm not sure who at, at what point noticed it, noticed it, but there's the name of this um, Italian sculptor, Fran M. Schiaffini, which is written at the back, uh, inscribed at the back. And um, the, the funny thing was that even though this was right there, um, there was some confusion because uh, this claim that Wellesley may have ordered it essentially meant that by that time Schiaffini was dead. So he passes away in 1763 or so. The, the government house is made in 1803. So was it his studio which um, created these? Was it someone else who created these? Now, because Curzon said it's Wellesley, you know, people thought that you know, maybe that is what it is. But we are now questioning that and, and trying to wonder if there is some way in which it could possibly have been sculpted by Schiaffini himself as opposed to uh, his studio po posthumously. So um, this seems quite interesting to me in the sense that uh, there is a name inscribed literally into the stone but uh, there, there seems to be still some room for doubt. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, when we are looking at uh, the histories of Italian art, whether um, from the biography of Schiaffini, do we know of whether he accepted these kinds of commissions, executed them? I mean, what are the odds that this would have happened in his lifetime? So if um, Professor Osagnio could please respond to that. Yes, of course. Let me say that I'm so glad to be here this evening and to see uh, the 12 sculptures in this beautiful garden that for me is the right place to stand. Because uh, there are an expression of uh, the classic beauty. And uh, let me start uh, with uh, a point. I have no doubts regarding who was the author. To me, the sculptures were made by Francesco Maria Schiaffino. And, uh, and I have also an idea of the periods when 
he realized that. Because uh, uh, Francesco Maria was born in Genoa. Genoa is the north city of Italy and is a very crucial, important center for commerce and for business. And uh, he came, as it was at that time, from a family of uh, conciapietre, people with a lot of experience during the centuries in works on stones. And uh, as a lot of young artists at that age, uh, he decided to move from Genoa, where? In Rome. Because Rome was, uh, the, at that age, for that young artist, the place where to improve. And in which way? Copying and realizing uh, some experience, taking an inspiration from the past, Roman, but not only Roman, also Greek classical statues, and also the big artists of the Italian Renaissance. And it was Michelangelo Buonarroti, for example, because he had the opportunity, for sure, to copy the Mose, the Mose of Michelangelo Buonarroti in Rome. For sure, we know, because uh, uh, in the historical archives in Italy, we have some paper um, sending uh, from uh, his uh, master in Rome. It was uh, the sculptor Rusconi uh, to Piola, that was a good artist uh, coming from the north part of Italy, that suggested the young Schiaffino for the uh, workshop in Rome of uh, Rusconi's sculpture. And Rusconi told us that Schiaffino spends about four years copying uh, lots of uh, important statues in Rome. And let me say that uh, it was so common at that age, uh, also starting from the previous centuries, uh, to have uh, copies of ancient sculpture. And uh, let me explain it a little bit the reason why it was done. Because they realized that uh, in the past, you can find something of beauty that could uh, uh, help you to express beauty in your own uh, operas. So that's the reason why also nowadays we use to improve young people to copy, to copy from the past, to copy from Roman status, to copy from Bernini, Michelangelo. And that's the reason why to me it's so crucial that nowadays we have this Schiaffino emperor here because they stand in a beautiful garden with a lot of kids that uh, should copy they should understand that the relationship with beauty is something that has no latitude, that has no time. They can take an experience of beauty in the place that they used to stay uh, to be fun. And that's, a, to me, it was a great and so grateful for the decision to have the status here in this garden. And let me say they have no Many dopes. Okay, it, wa it was written in the back of the emperors, but let me say that uh, we will know, for example, that uh, uh, the bishop Ludovisi, uh, his uncle was the pope, uh, decided in the third decade of the uh, 16th century, so uh, centuries before, to have exactly uh, the copy of the 12 Caesar Hignitz collection. So if uh, in Rome, if you uh, look at the uh, Bon Compagni Ludovisi collection, you can find the two halves status of the Caesars. It was a masterpiece for private collection. So to me, I don't know exactly if, if Schiaffino decided to have they for him or for someone else. For sure he was, was well known in the heart market. It was uh, very well known in France, in Great Britain and in Portugal. And of course in Italy with a lot of uh, uh, churches that were made by him. 
but it was uh, it it has a really important big market of this status. And let me say that to me it was a, a kind of private collection. So it does it. To me, it's not important when they came in India because uh, for sure they followed someone because the people at that age, but also now, they used to move with the masterpiece. They felt we, they confident with the places. So to me, uh, they were done around 1720 and 1724 perhaps some years later. We will know that uh, there is uh, the raptor of the um, Proserpina in one national museum in Genoa. That is ex not exactly the copy of Bernini, raptor of the, uh, the Proserpina, but uh, that, let me say, that uh, was clearly related with his experience in Rome. So to me, we, I, can, I would like to give this uh, idea, of course, uh, to solve the enigma and uh, you know beauty is something that they used to travel a lot uh, and it's amazing that to find here this kind of beautiful status in this beautiful garden uh, thank you so much um, yeah i mean it's it, it would be i suppose um, you know we know that of course they were there in the raj bhavan from which they were transferred to the Victoria Memorial Hall sometime last year, I think. I'm not exactly sure of the date. Um, the, we now, um, thanks to Professor Rostagnio, we have a sense of roughly when they may have been um, sculpted by uh, Schiaffino. Now the question, of course, is that um, if, if Hypothetically, let's say there were archives in Italy or, or if there were archives of his studio that can corroborate that, we can, there might be a possibility. I don't know what, uh, what kinds of archives exist at this point. Um, the missing piece of the jigsaw right now seems to be how they got from Genoa to Kolkata, uh, to, to the governor's house, right? So, um, again, uh, Curzon dismisses those theories. Because uh, he says that, you know, his his idea is that uh, Kedleston Hall, which was kind of the model for the govern government house in Kolkata, which also happened to be Curzon's family seat. So Curzon says that they had 12 Caesars back in Kedleston Hall, and that is what they replicated here. So along with the architecture, the building itself, they replicated also the uh, 12 Caesars that were there in Kedleston. But um, he really has no sort of concrete evidence to back this up. I mean, he says that this is, it leads me to conclude that this is what may have happened. And unfortunately, that has kind of been taken a bit seriously by uh, historians to assert that this is indeed what happened. Now, uh, there is some doubt uh, in my view there. And of course, now that um, Professor Rostagnio also uh, seems, uh, seems to believe that, uh, there is reason to think that you know that they were actually made by Schiaffino. It 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 tempts us to revisit the possibility that you know they they came through the French or that that they were brought to India by the French and and um, subsequently taken over by the English. So um, realistically, do you think what are the odds? Would you say of of finding those missing pieces of this jigsaw? You know the ones that connect Genoa to Kolkata. Let me say that it's very interesting. Um, first of all, because, uh, um, you know, uh, it's a part of a collection, a private collection. I, I don't know exactly how they could be here nowadays. And this is the right strong enigma, but for sure we can solve it uh, working together uh, on historic archives to understand uh, how it was possible. But let me say that uh, it's very interesting, the idea that uh, um, beauty can move, also a piece of art uh, could move uh, all around the world. And uh, um, it was uh, very common at that uh, period. For example, you, uh, someone said that perhaps it they were made specifically for here. Uh, that could be. A copy is a very common approach, but uh, the signature in the back is something that 
could not be copied for us because uh, let me say if it was a, a, a sculpture of Michelangelo sometimes you can uh, some, some someone could uh, uh, do that but it was a uh, schiaffino so for sure it was uh, and he was so proud to put his signature on each of the that is very crucial also for us because it seems that it was really pro proud of it of the results he achieved we will know that he spent four years studying and his hand was not so good when he arrived in Rome. Had improved a lot. Uh, yesterday we had the opportunity to be close and we suggested to people to, to stay, stand close to the sculpture because you can see how it was at that time very good his hand in the way to work on the Carrara marble. Carrara marble is something of very strong in the effect because it's very white rarely it has some part in black or brown but it's very pure is amazing and also is amazing the way of light to, to work on the surface of the sculpture and uh, if you are uh, you can uh, you take a look of the details you can see something very uh, very good in the way you adopt to, to um, to, 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 to express the joyous of the emperor, the air, the decoration. So you can see a lot of attention. You can see, look at them closely, also the sign of the instruments that used to have that effect, the gradina, the typical instruments used to give a movement to the stones, to give expression to the walls, to give a reality to the hair, to the company. Uh, let me say that it's very important to have, I suppose that was a good collection that arrived in Kokata. And that's the reason why they took a lot of uh, time and patent to bring all the statues here. And uh, um, because uh, it was uh, rare at that time and uh, it was a sign of a new step in the history of art. They were so modern when uh, Schiaffino realized that because the new classic, a uh, new interpretation of the classic we have later with Canova for example with a lot of artists during that period. So it was a, a step. It was a kind of a announcement of something that uh, was happening at that time in the history of art. So that's the reason why to me they decided to move from the, I, we don't know exactly, is from, from directly from Italy for France, I suppose from uh, England. Uh, and uh, to bring them here, because uh, uh, they were so in touch with the uh, idea of beauty of that age. And it's classic, and uh, is, uh, to me, is uh, still talking to people also nowadays. So I, I hope to give an uh, idea of to your interesting question, but to me, it was for that. They were so in touch with the way to approach the beauty at that age. So that keeps a lot of time and uh, energy and money to move here, uh, to have here in Kokata, where the landscape is so beautiful. And if you have a look at, for example, to the beautiful garden that you can find in Italy, in Padua, in, uh, in a lot of uh, Italian classical garden, you have always beautiful tree, beautiful parterre, beautiful grass, grass area connected with the status. So let me say that this final destination is perfect because it is an expression of the beauty that this kind of works of art would like to celebrate. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, very interesting uh, response. The uh, one thing that I can't help but wonder is that, you know, whether there are 
or if there is a possibility of finding any other sculptures by Schiaffino that carry his signature or that carry his, uh, the inscription of his name with them, which would be a very, uh, which would take us a little further towards establishing whether in fact this is Schiaffino signing or uh, his studio, for example. But I mean, I'm, I, of course, personally, I'd be much more excited if it were Schiaffino, but uh, personal yeah. stakes aside. But let uh, me say that we uh, have got some historical document that said that uh, the papils decided to finish the contract already signed by the master. Right, right, right. Then they, we will know they took different ways and also in the expression. Mm -hmm. And one of his favorite went later to Kanoa. So he was a good master, but for sure they felt that he was the ones that could begin in, uh, with Rusconi in uh, Rome, the dis rediscovery of the past. But uh, also at that time, art was going and time was going. So it was a, a time of changing. So for sure uh, they moved. Mm -hmm. But uh, let me say, I, could, I can ask to the bishop in Genoa to take me a photo in a few days of the back of the status of the Madonna, yeah, yeah, and yeah. we can fight for sure. Mm -hmm. He was anyway, he was proud, proud of his uh, status, and he put the signature. He was young, let me say, he was young. That's the reason why you put so largely. And see, let me say, he, he would like to speak it ancient Italian, the language of Roman also in the way he put the signature mm -hmm. on the back of the status. Perhaps we one mistake. And uh, let me say that was uh, a way to express, because in that age we, we, we had a lot of uh, local languages in Italy. And uh, Latin was one coming from the past. And he chose that, to seek the picture in that way, to express that he was in connection with the classic for the, from the past, okay? So that's the reason why it's Great. quite interesting. And uh, um, anyway, I will ask to the bishop to give me a signature from the status of the Madonna. That would be wonderful, so absolutely. Uh, Gianluca, uh, at the beginning mentioned that uh, this is, there are two, there are, in fact, I mean, we could also think of the statue of Cornwallis that stands on the eastern quadrangle, which was by uh, John Bacon, uh, which is, which as um, Professor Tapoti Gohotakurata, who has worked on the statues at the Victoria Memorial says, um, that, that if you look at that statue, you notice there is a line near the neck, which basically indicates that it's a very awkward, juxtaposition of the head of an English governor general onto the body of a Roman emperor. And uh, which is to say that, um, you know, the, the iconography of imperial Rome is something that the British self-consciously, you know, carried with them and, and used to um, kind of convey their sense of imperial power. So, I'm just wondering whether, uh, Professor Choudhury, if you would like to uh, speak about that and whether you see this as a continuous tradition. I mean, whether in whoever this was, Wellesley or uh, someone before. So is there a sort of continuous tradition that we see in terms of this uh, use appropriation of uh, Roman symbols of imperialism by the British? Well, I should really begin by saying that I'm not a really fit person to answer this question, that I'm not a historian of the British period or any period. Uh, so I can only talk in a sort of wider perspective. I mean, of course, the British uh, were uh, trying to absorb the, the Roman uh, imperial heritage, tradition, that aura in their own rule, which was still at a if not quite at a nascent stage, at a pretty early stage at the start of the 19th century, 1803, when Government House, Rajabhavan, was built. But the story, you know, if you want to trace it, actually, the, the European tradition from Roman times is much more complicated than that. Because, I mean, about the 4th, 5th century, the Roman Empire had dwindled away in the West. In the East, it still continued for several centuries as the Byzantine Empire, but in the West, it dwindled away. Okay. But the legacy of Rome remained important in Europe, practically continuously, but in a 
much more intensified way and in very special ways from the time of what we call the Renaissance. The, well, from the 15th century, basically, the, in fact, the late 14th, if you like. And there are two aspects to this, uh, this Roman inheritance in Europe. One is uh, what we call the translatio imperi, the transmission of the imperial ideal of power, the political ideal. Okay. Uh, and this effectively did not find adequate expression in the history of Europe ever subsequently. I mean, when the British and the French, to some extent the Dutch, they came to set up empires centuries later, about, uh, they, they did not do it in Europe. Okay, they saved the scenes and established their empires overseas. There was something through the Middle Ages and through the Renaissance and beyond in Europe called the Holy Roman Empire. But uh, you know, that well-worn historian's joke, uh, it was said to be neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Uh, the first Holy Roman Emperor was the Emperor Charlemagne, okay, 8th century. He was actually anointed by the then Pope as continuing the, as the, the tradition of the Roman Empire. The mantle of the Roman Emperors fell on him. And he, of course, came from the region which today we call France, where his empire was uh, focused. I mean, that was the central part. Later on, it shifted more to the region which we would today call Germany. And the Holy Roman Emperor might at any given point of time be a person of some power and influence or not, depending on his other connections, not on the fact of his being the Holy Roman Emperor as such. And the, but the geographically, the heart of the, this very vacuous sort of uncertain kind of empire was the region of Germany, which at that time far from being an imperial power, was not even the United Nation, nor was Italy. I mean, as I did not tell you, neither Italy nor Germany became a United Nation again till the 19th century. So this uh, tradition of um, you know, the, the imperial power, that aspect of the Roman heritage, that is very much something floating in the air, really, not actually embodied in substantial political, political constructs. But the other aspect, the much more crucial aspect of the Roman inheritance, what was called Translatio Studi, the, the transmission of studies, meaning you know, the intellectual, artistic, and cultural legacy of the Roman Empire, which in one way or other was sustained almost continuously through what we call the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, a funny term, isn't it? Middle, just joining two periods before and after, apparently without any importance of its own. Well, ancient uh, culture d was studied and uh, employed culturally in various ways, even in the Middle Ages. But of course, it got a huge fillip I mean, uh, with the coming of the Renaissance, late 14th, 15th century onwards, roughly, when Greco-Roman culture was studied much more intensively, revived in new ways. And once it's Greco-Roman, but in Western Europe, it was the Roman uh, legacy that was much more important. Because they were, although the greater Greece, Magna Graeca of the past, extended into Italy and beyond, the, by far the greatest quantity of um, ancient relics to be found in Western Europe were, of course, Roman. The language that was current in Western Europe, well, till the 18th, 19th century, and to some extent even the present day, is Latin, the language of the Romans, not the language of the Greeks. And this cultural uh, inheritance of uh, the Romans remained very important as a kind of infusing presence in the very new development, cultural developments of the Renaissance and beyond. You see, it's as though for in one way, the Renaissance particularly was trying to, as it were, um, give its culture the stamp of approval with uh, kind of um, putting a Roman seal upon it. When very early in the Renaissance, almost before the Renaissance had well begun, one of its original founders um, and um, sort of pathbreakers, Petrarca, Petrarch, the poet and scholar and writer, um, 
he spent most of his life outside Italy, in fact, in France. But when the opportunity came for him to be crowned as a poet on the Capitoline Hill in Rome, he seized the opportunity. Okay. And he was crowned with a, a, a wreath of laurels in the but the artificial tradition to be derived from ancient Rome. And thus, the, you know, the sort of trappings of ancient Rome, the, the costumes, particularly the Roman toga, that came to be a sort of big cultural adornment for all kinds of scholarly and literary and artistic attainments in the Renaissance and beyond. I mean, the evidence is not always very clear, as it was wonder, but there's one passage, a very famous passage in particular, that I wonder about. It's a, it's a letter written by Machiavelli, okay, early in the 16th century, to a friend of his, Lorenzo Vettori. And Machiavelli was not only a person who wrote this sinister work of political theory, in fact, not really sinister, it's a very profound work. He has several works, in fact. He was also a humanist scholar, and he was a in practical administrator and politician. And in this letter to his friend, he says, that I spent the whole day in the office, the government office, on the business of the state. Then when I come home in the evening, I go to my library. And you know, people, as a rule, don't dress up to go to a library, especially the library of their own home. But Machiavelli says that he did. He would lay aside you know, the, the, the stuffy, sweaty, uh, cramped clothes in which he was off his office guard, and he would put on different kind of dress, which he describes as robes which are royal and courtly. Panne reali e kulkuriali. Now, what does he mean by that? He doesn't say. But clearly, they couldn't have been anything very formal or anything very tight, because that's the kind of clothes he was wearing all day in the government office. He was to get out of them. And without, I would like to think that without really um, being exactly modeled on the Roman toga, it was some kind of you know, loose flowing garment of that sort, in which he says he would enter his library and lose himself in the company of the ancient poets and writers. And, uh, well, Italy, of course, was the very heart of the Renaissance, but just within a hundred years, you find uh, something comparable happening in uh, a country that was on the outer margins of the Renaissance, really, though remarkable things happened there, namely Britain. And the point is that, you see, the, even the imperial iconography of Rome, the 12 Caesars among them, are assimilated to this. i just cite two examples. One is um, that the Sheldonian Theatre of the University of Oxford, this is the University Hall okay, of Oxford University. Late in the 17th century, Sir Christopher Wren, the great architect, he endowed Oxford University with the money to set up the busts of the 12 Caesars on the walls outside the Sheldonian Theatre of the University of Oxford. So clearly here the ideal in question was not of imperial political rule, but of the classical tradition of scholarship. When the neoclassical age was well underway, even earlier, uh, in the, uh, I'm thinking of the library of Sir Robert Cotton, who lived from the late 16th to the early 17th century. So let's say what I'm talking about happened in the early 17th century. Sir Robert Cotton had this huge collection of manuscripts, classical manuscripts, of course, but also Anglo-Indian um, um, or um, Anglo-Saxon manuscripts. The only manuscript of the great Anglo-Saxon epic, Beowulf, that is part of Cotton's collection. Well, Cotton kept his collection in a series of cupboards, you know, of almirahs in his palace. And on top of these almirahs were the busts of the 12 Caesars. And in fact, the manuscripts are known to this day by the names of those Caesars. You see, each uh, uh, the manuscript might be called, uh, for instance, the Beowulf manuscript is part of manuscript Cotton Vitellius A15, meaning it's in the cupboard with the bust of the Emperor Vitellius on top is A, the first shelf, the 15th book. Okay. But the most interesting thing is that there were not just the busts of the 12 Caesars. There were 14 cupboards. The 12 Caesars, yes. Two more busts. Who? Two other Roman emperors? No. 
of two women associated with the Roman Empire. One of them, this may or may not surprise you, was Cleopatra. And uh, who was the other? It was Faustina. Faustina was the Roman Empress. She was the wife of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Now, Marcus Aurelius was a scholarly man. He wrote this great philosophical work of the Meditations. So he himself would have been a very appropriate figure for a bust in a library. But what you find there is not the bust of Marcus Aurelius, but his wife, Faustina. Okay. So, you see, what I'm trying to get at is that this cultural tradition derived from the Roman Empire and assimilated to the busts of the Caesars is really part of a cultural and literary and intellectual tradition as much as the imperial through uh, much of the of uh, uh, European cultural history, especially the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment. And this transfers itself to India. You find that the, the early European Orientalists in India, their busts are uh, similarly in classical garb. Now, there's this remarkable statue, which in fact is in the west quadrangle of the Victoria Memorial. You've all seen it, don't you remember it? A statue which very irreverently always reminds me of an athletic victory stand. You know, first, second, third, and three levels. There's a statue there with three figures. On the top is a figure which is actually that of Warren Hastings, standing for the Western intellectual tradition. One step down in the position of the second prize, as it were, is a Brahmin, Indian or Hindu tradition. And still further lower down, in the third position, is somebody in the garb of a, 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 Muslim, a, a Muslim scholar, an Islamic scholar. Okay. It's a, well, in some ways, a very obnoxious, a very typical uh, presentation, symbolic presentation of the hierarchy of um, the knowledge as conceived in, in British India. Okay. But the interesting thing is that though the Hindu scholar and the, the Islamic scholar wear the appropriate garbs of their own cultures, Warren Hastings is not dressed in the British costume of his day. He's dressed in a Roman toga. Uh, this was um, the statue dates from about 1830. But even earlier, you find that there are busts in the Asiatic society of the you know, the early great Orientalists, so William Jones, Goldbrook, Wilson, and all these busts again, their uh, drapery is, uh, at least vaguely, like a Roman toga, not the dress of the, the English gentlemen of their time. Now, Let's see with this, I'll let me close now by bringing this to bear on the 12 Caesars in, uh, uh, in um, uh, what originally the government house, so the Raj Bhavan, they're now here. Now, well, think again of that statue in the West Quadrangle here with Warren Hastings at the top, representing Western culture and learning, okay? Not Western political rule primarily. Now, and maybe that characterizes the early stages of British imperial power. I mean, first, the start of Robert Clive, it was probably simply loot. Okay. By the time you come to Warren Hastings, it becomes more of, an, of a more serious intellectual engagement with this country. But then when you come to Cornwallis and to Wellesley, that is when perhaps the colonial ideal begins to extend and to transform itself into the imperial ideal. And that, I think, is the ideal which Wellesley might have been the first to incorporate on in any significant way, monumentally, in the, first of all, in the very construction of the Rajbhav, of the government house. Uh, the, the, this huge palace, which would be an appropriate seat of British rule in India. Although, in fact, Imperial power was to wait another 54 years. India was still uh, sort of conducted to the extent it was from European sources by the East India Company, not by the Crown. But that ideal of imperial rule was instilled by Wellesley using also Cornwallis. There's a statue of Cornwallis there, again, dressed in a Roman toga. Okay. And uh, 
the, the, these Roman emperors, I think, are part of that transition. So yes, these Roman emperors, I think, can be assimilated with the idea of British imperialism, but not quite in any very simple way. That the idea of British imperial rule was a pretty new one that people like Cornwallis, and Cornwallis was still alive at the time, you must remember, uh, when this big statue of his was being set up. And Cornwallis, Wellesley, they were the people who were first trying to incorporate it in British India. And these statues are a kind of marginal part, shall we say, a footnote to that um, history. Thank you. Um, yeah. We can ask maybe yeah, sure. the public. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Shukantada, for that. Um, you know, the one thing that, again, this is not a question for us to answer strictly, but it's something that we also might. Um, it might be worth thinking about, which is that, you know, there is, of course, a lot of talk of decolonization, museums, how to curate or recurate artifacts. And it strikes me as um, somewhat remarkable, you know, that um, these sculptures, which have a certain um, status as historical objects, uh, the way they are positioned right now, they seem like, you know, the same way that, that at the Marble Palace you would see some random name for something like that. So it's, it, it looks kind of ornamental in the way that they are right now. But um, I, I suppose they deserve a little better. And, and, and in terms of, I wonder, uh, you know, what kind of curatorial intervention could do that, but also, in my view, avoid, uh, you know, setting up um, standards of universalizing uh, beauty and grace and so on and forth. So, so somewhere between the two, I suppose, uh, there should be some sort of curatorial intervention and that's, I think, it's an open question. It's a provocation of sorts. So I'm not, I mean, if any of you wishes to uh, respond, please uh, do so by all means. But um, that was just kind of uh, something that has been bothering me and the fact that they are not kind of uh, accompanied by some explanatory note to me, betrays this, this uh, you know, uh, discomfort with colonial heritage and, and so on and forth. So, uh, yeah. to write. Uh, yes, I think some kind of is, you know, explanatory block there is really, really necessary. Not just giving the history of the busts, but also, uh, you know, just locating them in the history of our country. Because otherwise, they do come to seem like, you know, the kind of ornamental bric-a-brac that uh, later on, 100 or 150 years down the line, 100 years down the line, was to adorn the palaces and the estates of many you know, members of the Indian aristocracy uh, who were very much reliant on the Raj. See? So it was a, that kind of almost parasitic presence and incidental presence of uh, uh, you know, the bric-a-brac of uh, various European traditions. Um, that you find dotted about uh, the whole of India, really. But that these busts I have occasionally had a more focused historical purpose. I think this, in the, if they're going to be exhibited in the Victoria Memorial, that uh, explanatory block is really very, very necessary. Um, thank you so much for that, uh, Shugantoda, and perhaps Gianluca, the Italian. No, I was wondering could, if anybody yeah. from the public has. Anything to ask? We cannot see very well, and I don't know if there is a microphone available for the public. Uh, we there can is. pass one yeah. of these around as well. I don't think so. That. If anybody has something to ask, please stand up, introduce yourself, uh, and ask your question. I don't see anybody standing up, so I guess there are no questions. So we. <laughs> Ah, no, there is somebody. Sorry, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Shomudi Pry. I'm a visual artist. <coughs> so I had a question uh, regarding, say, the, the Lawsy Institute, since we were also talking about the Governor House. And uh, would, would the, uh, the Lawsy Institute also perhaps have the 12 Caesars as a part of their exhibit in the museum? I, I honestly have no idea. Do you know if they do? I mean, th I, there may well be more 12 Caesars around because it was something that uh, there's this wonderful book by Mary Beard called The Twelve Caesars where she traces this because, you know, the, the uh, sheer 
number of, I mean, the sheer proliferation of the 12 Caesars as a kind of series. Um, it's, it's almost of anthropological interest, you know, why are people this obsessed with these 12 Caesars? And, and they appear in coins, they appear in matchbox labels, asterisk, all, all kinds of things. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if there are uh, the 12 Caesars there. But from what I remember, there was this uh, publication by the PWD in 1902 which was a list of monuments, busts, and statues of historical importance in Calcutta. From what I remember from that catalog, this was probably the only reference to the 12th season, but I may be mistaken. So uh, there may have been uh, more, more as well, yeah. Uh, there's a question over there. If It strikes me that, you know, having busts carved of the 12 Caesars, even locally, would everything else apart have meant a substantial investment of money. See, whether the, the Dalhousie Institute had that kind of funds, I mean, that's a very mundane question that also we should bear in mind, you know. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Shabun. I'm also a student of English at Jalufpur University. So I had a question. Uh, I was wondering, of course, Britain as an imperial power arrives very late in the scene. There are other countries that are already doing that kind of work. So and also, um, well, it has really no imperial tradition to perhaps <laughs> Uh, latch on to. So can we sort of say that uh, in the, what we see in the 19th century with the increase in this uh, colonizing interest, uh, they are uh, perhaps trying to form a link with their own Roman past because of course Rome and Britain are connected uh, because Britain was of course uh, kind of a part of the empire. Um, let me say that, uh, thank you for your question, and uh, let me say that uh, um, starting from an artistic point of view, uh, the uh, sculptures were made uh, almost a centuries before the use and the transport. They went transport to to here. So let me say that uh, uh, the original meanings of the sculpture it was not to celebrate imperialism. That was for sure not in the idea of the sculpture. It was the idea to uh, find a classical beauty that uh, was uh, lost during the medieval times. So it was uh, it was it was uh, more easy because the day come back to the ancient techniques to for the sculpture, for uh, construction, for example. Also the dome that uh, you can have here is uh, an uh, heritage of the Roman domes that uh, they used to build uh, for the uh, therme, for the uh, uh, temple f that uh, they have before. So let me say that uh, um, the connection between heart and languages, uh, taken from the history, has not uh, uh, formed an artist uh, meanings that concern policy and other. They are they were looking uh, something of beauty, and they realized after the medieval time that uh, that would like to improve a renaissance of uh, art and craft uh, and of art in general so that's the reason why they approached the ancient status let me say that before all the rediscovery of the ancient uh, uh, status uh, of roman and greek were in the ground so they started to uh, uh, ar ar an archaeological approach uh, to study the beauty, not because the meanings, because at that time, Italy, uh, until the reunion of our land, was uh, divided, and the uh, idea of uh, an emperor was so far from our reality, and it still is nowadays. Our approach uh, with the, and our relationship with the symbols of the past uh, is quite different. Uh, for sure, we remind that part of our history, but uh, no one in Italy uh, looking at a 12th emperor have an idea of the imperialism in looking there. But to see 12 beautiful men 
and 12 well done sculpture and uh, that's uh, for us uh, the relation thing of that part of our history because uh, they uh, we use that to improve ourselves and sen a sense of renaissance to uh, to born again to be able to achieve beauty to be able to uh, uh, to have a beautiful architecture and so on. So it's quite different for us, uh, the relationship. And uh, let me say for sure, um, uh, people coming from uh, Great Britain and France used to take away the Sacco di Roma to... Uh, they use our heritage. So lots of our, as it was for... Uh, the Parthenon. Parthenon is London. A lot of uh, important uh, our uh, sculpture and painting are in uh, different museums, not in Italy, because uh, they used to keep they away from our collection. But uh, okay, that's the part of the also of the past, uh, and uh, heritage is uh, something that concerns humanity. So. For us, uh, but let me say that for sure Schiaffino has no idea of the imperialism. He was a simple boy, he, uh, uh, he growing up uh, in a bottega, so he was not so good uh, in writing in uh, Latin, let me say, but uh, he discovered the beauty and discovered how to improve his end. When he arrived in Rome, he was no good. After five years copying and studying, he growing up. So that to me is the message that uh, the author uh, give us with the 12th emperor. If you want to study, if you want to apply, you could become a good sculptor. For sure, he, he, he will be very happy to see you talking about uh, his uh, emperor. That to me was uh, an own as exercise for him to be able to copy, to be in touch with something of really Unbelievable in terms of perfection. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so, if uh, you want to say something, add a couple of points to the reply to the question. First of all, um, yes, I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, you have enlightened us very uh, well, very in great detail about uh, how you know the imperial ethos was not really part of the. The, the, the presentation of the 12 Caesars through the centuries in Europe, but it was maybe then revived by the British, and for all I know, the French. I know nothing about the, the cultural history of the French Empire, so I can't say. It was uh, just a sort of almost an artificial revival. Um, but I don't think that the Roman rule over Britain uh, in the, you know, just uh, before and after. Uh, the, the, the coming of Christ, that that had much to do with it because there the Romans were the subjects. Uh, I'm sorry, the British were the subjects, right? They were not the conquerors. And the Roman rule has very little presence in any period of British cultural history other than the purely archaeological. And they were certainly not going to revive it when, uh, you know, r r cultivating their own hopes of uh, imperial rule. And the other thing is that. Uh, you know, I would suggest, as for historians to say that, whether this is valid, a uh, distinction between the, the colonial and the imperial models. Okay. The imperial is a much grander notion of power and rule, which overlays the, the economic purpose of this. The Dutch, the Belgians in Congo, they were colonial powers. The British, the French, they were imperial powers. So I think it's a distinction worth making. Uh, and to uh, hijack the, uh, if I may use the word, the, the 12 Caesars for this new imperial ideal, so very different from the Roman, this is uh, worth uh, a distinction worth bearing in mind. Thank you. We don't want to hijack uh, the Caesars. We are just very happy that they now are part uh, of the landscape of the Victoria Memorial. And uh, we have to be, I think, grateful for those here who decided to accept uh, this challenge and to try to fit them into the context, creating a specific space for them. 
So uh, I have to thank uh, our distinguished guests here, the professor, the professor from Italy, our master of the conversations, and uh, of course the Victoria Memorial Museum. I don't know if you want to say something or if I can close it here. So I thank all of you for being here now. I don't think uh, you have the possibilities to see the scissors, you have to come back. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed and you can go back uh, with the idea that some parts of the enigma are still uh, to be cracked. Uh, there is a code to be cracked, uh, but maybe we have a clearer idea and next time you pass by you may think of what we have said this evening. Thank you again. Good evening. Um, yeah, just on a concluding note, thank you, a very sincere thank you to His Excellency, the Consul General of Italy, Dr. Rubagotti. Thank you to Dr. Rostagno, Professor Choudhury, and Dr. Mukherjee, a whole lot of doctors and professors on the podium, so it makes me very nervous. Um, unfortunately, the Caesars are not visible, only Nero is visible. Hopefully, nobody hears a violin or a flute, uh, whichever version of that uh, saying you subscribe to. Uh, yeah, so in the next time, as uh, the Consul General said, when you're visiting the Victoria Memorial, do give a few minutes to the emperors. And um, in, in, in hell, paradise, or purgatory, wherever Suetonius is right now, I think he feels damn vindicated <laughs> that the 12 Caesars end up in, in Kolkata. Um, a, thanks, a sincere thanks to the Secretary and Curator, Mr. Samarindra Kumar of the Victoria Memorial Hall, and all our light, uh, sound, and support staff, uh, and of course the caretaking staff. Uh, and uh, before we close, of course, the customary tea uh, and other refreshments await us uh, in front of the administrative building, so the usual location from which it's just straight from here, just follow the lights. Uh, and we also have some uh, special refreshments from uh, the Italian Consulate General in Kolkata, so we are all looking forward to that. So I won't take up any more of your time because that's just wasting time before food. So good night and good evening. <laughs>